All right, everybody should be able to see my screen, I hope. Now it's a matter of starting the slideshow. Okay, now everybody can hopefully see the screen. Can everybody hear me okay? Is that, okay, perfect. Perfect. Well, allow me to introduce myself here very briefly. Uh, my name is Alex Painter. I do live here in Richmond. I've lived in Richmond for the most part uh, since 2006 when I began as a student, a first year student at uh, Earlham College. So I'd like to thank the Wayne County Historical Museum for allowing me to speak tonight on this topic. And just as a quick aside, my wife and I have a seven-year-old son and twin five-year-old daughters. And we recently took a trip to the museum ourselves. And my daughter Harper was recently gifted an Amelia Earhart t-shirt and she's going through a bit of a phase. So she was elated to see the 1930s era airplane on display on the main floor. So I guess when, when it comes to kids and museums, you may not get to stay as long as you'd like to, which was the case for us, but they do have just an innate ability to learn and absorb so much more than, you know, even at their age than most of us adults. So I'd like to thank my family, even though they're upstairs trying to be as quiet as they can be, I'd like to thank them for kind of putting up with me. But uh, welcome to the uh, presentation here. Okay, so I studied history at Earlham College under the tutelage of the great Tom Ham, who I know is heavily involved with the museum. And I'm going to relay this quote here. If you want to better understand America, study baseball. And I don't really relay this quote to convince myself that baseball studies are an important part of American history. I actually relay this to this quote to actually reinforce that. Uh, baseball, as America's pastime, has intersected with nearly every major event or movement in the country's history, whether that be the American Civil War, both World Wars, issues such as immigration, nativism, segregation, gender studies, went labor, history. I mean, baseball in so many respects is inexorably connected. And I am trying to push this quote as widespread as possible because I do believe it to be true. And I think the deeper you look at baseball, I think the deeper you understand that this is actually the case. And now I picked this beautiful picture here for a very specific reason. This is the 1939 East-West Negro League All-Stars game picture. And you are actually looking at the East team. So if I may, there are a number of Hall of Famers in this picture. Uh, this is Buck Leonard. He was a longtime Homestead Gray. This is a gentleman named Willie Wells. Uh, this is a gentleman named Mule Suttles. I would be remiss not to mention that all three played in Richmond, as well as this gentleman here. This is Josh Gibson, who we will talk about. He also played in Richmond. And Leon Day, a pitcher. All of these guys are Baseball Hall of Famers. Now, the gentleman who is literally front and center in this image, this is a guy. His name is Bill Holland. He is an Indianapolis native. His nickname was Devil because he was an absolute fierce competitor. Now, this picture was taken in 1939. 21 years earlier, he actually recorded his debut as a Richmond Giant uh, for the Richmond, Indiana Giants as a 17-year-old kid. So 21 years later, he is actually in the All-Star game as a much older man. But uh, I do point that out because you do have someone here who, you know, got their start in Richmond playing baseball for the Richmond Giants, who we will talk about. <clears throat> now, I know you're hearing a lot about the Negro Leagues in the news lately, and that is for some very good reasons. So first, this last year, I should say, 2020 marked the centennial of the Negro Leagues. Now, there has been black baseball for much, much longer than that. But in 1920, the Negro National League was founded. And so therefore, 2020 became the centennial. So there was a lot of widespread celebration to commemorate the Negro Leagues. Uh, now, to kind of highlight the 2020 year, uh, Major League Baseball, as the uh, headline would otherwise indicate, recognize the Negro Leagues as a, quote, major league, which was correcting a, quote, long-time oversight. So now in the annals of baseball history, well, now the Negro Leagues are considered a major league. And if you were otherwise unaware that they weren't already, 
Well, they weren't until literally less than, well, right about two months ago. So really, really exciting things on the national landscape for the Negro Leagues. And there are tons of people who have worked very, very diligently uh, and, and for a very long time for this designation and this distinction. Now, you might be hearing about the Negro Leagues here locally because, yes, uh, we just recently got our very own Negro Leagues marker uh, here in Glen Miller Park. So if you're kind of an eagle eye, this is right next to the Rose Garden, uh, right across from, well, actually right next to the main entrance of Glen Miller Park. This location was actually very, very specifically selected. And that is because right across the street, so basically right behind me here, uh, is where Old Exhibition Park was. Now, this was a stadium that, believe it or not, was actually larger than McBride. Um, which is our current baseball stadium. It was built in 1917 and played host to no fewer than 13 Negro League baseball players who would later become baseball Hall of Famers. Now, it burned down, unfortunately, in 1935, which led to the construction of Municipal Stadium, now called McBride. Now, uh, I should also mention that well, given the weather here locally, uh, this did not happen, but it's going to happen in about two weeks. Hopefully, we don't have to literally shovel the marker out. But if you're ever in Glen Miller Park, particularly when the weather is a little bit nicer, please feel free. This is, uh, I actually designed this myself, and uh, all of the information on this placard here comes directly from uh, the book that Maggie was so uh, kind to show off uh, a little bit earlier. So please, by all means, go and enjoy this history. It's A lot of it has just been recently discovered and newly chronicled. Um, and yes, and it was chronicled in the book here, Black Ball and the Hoosier Heartland, Unearthing the Negro League's Baseball History of Richmond, Indiana. Just to give a short brief introduction to that. At some point in 2019, my brother Adam is in the room here. He could probably tell me about the, the rough time that I began this project, but I decided to go forth with what I really thought was going to be a small research project that was honestly fueled more by curiosity than anything. I would never have guessed that when I was trying to figure out how many Negro League baseball games were played in Richmond, Indiana, that that number would eclipse 125 and 350 Negro Leagues baseball players passed through the city. Those were just the ones I could confirm. So a question I'm asked a lot, and speaking of questions, I'm sorry, if you have questions, throw them in the chat because I will get to them here once I've kind of uh, gotten through the presentation here. Um, and I'd be happy to answer anything and everything about uh, any of the subject matter here. But a question I get a lot is why they come to Richmond? How did they come to Richmond? When did they come to Richmond? And those 125 games happened between 1907 and 1959. So about a five-decade span there. But Negro League teams, they would spend a lot of time on the road. That was called barnstorming. And they would play in large cities. They'd play in small cities. They'd play in tiny towns. They'd play on sandlots. They would play anywhere because it was just they did not have the same infrastructure as a lot of the white leagues. So Negro League teams, in an effort to balance their sometimes precarious or unstable financial ledgers, they would play exhibition games in smaller cities like Richmond, you know, for additional revenue on their way to or from Dayton or Indianapolis or Cincinnati. And it really, truly allowed for some of the most dazzling baseball talent in America to just so unassumingly pass through the city on a consistent basis year after year after year after year. So before we jump into this, this phenomenon of the Negro Leagues passing through our, our humble community, let's set the stage with a little bit of timeline, uh, set the stage and in, in some context here with a timeline. So this, I present to you my incredibly simple timeline of Major League Baseball's racial history from 1860 to 1960. All right, so like any good timeline, yes, we have a flat plane here. Now, 1860, that's an intentional year to select because it's right before the American Civil War begins, of course, and that is right when the burgeoning sport of baseball is really starting to catch on. In fact, something that a lot of people don't know is that in the election cycle of 1860, baseball was used heavily 
in the marketing and the promotion. Oftentimes, the presidential candidates, Abraham Lincoln being one of them, was they were actually portrayed as baseball players. And whereas Stephen Douglas and John Breckenridge and John Bell were holding regular sized baseball bats, in one of the ads, it had Honest Abe, you know, rather than swinging a baseball bat, he was swinging a fence rail post. So uh, baseball has figured heavily in the American conscience since then. And then 1960. Well, why 1960? Well, it's 100 years from 1860, but in 1959, now Jackie Robinson, of course, integrated baseball famously in 1947, but 1959, the final team in baseball, the Boston Red Sox, finally integrated with a gentleman by the name of Pumpsy Green. That was 12 years after Jackie Robinson. So everything that we're going to talk about kind of fits snugly between these two planes. All right, so let's start filling it in. In 1876, the very first major league was founded, the National League, which is still actually in existence today. Now, this is a gentleman by the name of Moses Fleetwood Walker. And in 1884, he became the last black major league baseball player. He was suiting up for the Toledo Blue Stockings, who were um, not in the National League, but they were in the American Association, which was a major league at that time. So, before Jackie Robinson, Moses Fleetwood Walker was the final black major leaguer. Now, there were tons, not tons, but there was a good amount of minor leaguers who were black, but that came to a screeching halt in 1887 when Cap Anson, who was a star for the Chicago White Sox, refused to play a Newark, New Jersey team that featured none other than Moses Walker here. And so starting in 1887, this gentleman's agreement went into play that barred black baseball players from all of organized baseball, major leagues, minor leagues across the country. So 1887 is when the proverbial, you know what, starts to really hit the fan. And of course, in 1896, the groundbreaking Plessy v. Ferguson, groundbreaking for all the wrong reasons I'd like to add, which was the separate but equal doctrine, which really legalized segregation, kind of legalized all of these practices, not just in baseball, but that's where you saw different water fountains, schools, pretty much everything. And 1900, so we'll just kind of put the turn of the century mark there. And then in 1947, of course, you have number 42 himself, Jackie Robinson, who becomes the first black baseball player since Moses Fleetwood Walker in 1884 to play for a major league team. So yes, for a large chunk of this, 63 years, there are no black baseball players at the major league level. So let's continue the staging here uh, and set some more context. Let's talk about baseball in Richmond now, because um, baseball, early baseball in Richmond, Indiana is interesting to say the least. And for me personally, nothing exemplifies early baseball quite like the 1888 poem, Casey at the Bat. And I just uh, just discovered this painting by Jim uh, Zinganos, but I just love the indelible image of Casey of the Mudville Nine kind of cavalierly twirling his mustache while, as you can see, perfect strikes are just whizzing by him. I got to figure out how to get my hands on a print of this. I love it. But anyways, this is what a lot of those baseball players actually kind of looked like. So let's talk about Richmond, Indiana and baseball in the city in the 1880s. So the very decade that Casey at the bat was actually published. Now, the gentleman on the left, if you're a savant of Richmond history, he's instantly familiar. That's Thomas W. Bennett. He actually served as the mayor of Richmond three different times. He's the gentleman who, if you're in the area, you know that there are streets that have uh, numbers and streets that have letters. He started that, uh, and he was also the colonel of the 69th uh, Indiana Infantry, which was the uh, regiment uh, during the Civil War that was based primarily and mostly of soldiers from this area. However, an awesome guy, it would seem, did not like baseball. In fact, he would actually make it his duty to round up baseballers all across the city. Particularly, he tried to snuff it out when they were when the baseball players were young. So it wasn't uncommon that he would get children. He'd find children and he would bring them into his office and he would give them a stern lecture about the, the perils and the pitfalls of playing baseball. In fact, he told a story once about one of his best buddies who's, who quotes, beauty, manly grace, and towering intellect 
were once the pride of his entire family, but how he gradually sank beneath the seductive influence of the deadly game until he went to his grave, a terrible evidence of what baseball will do to its victims, end quote. So Bennett was not a baseball fan, and he wanted to make sure that, you know, the youth of the city understood that. So there's accounts where the, the youth of the city would leave his office absolutely crying and in tears, but that wasn't enough. He was going to charge him $5.65, which equates to $142.34 today. So if you wanted to, get, if you got caught playing baseball in the city in the 1880s, particularly on a Sunday, yeah, you were in trouble. So then everybody kind of fled to the grounds of Earlham College, my humble alma mater. And there for a time, you know, Earlham hosted these baseball games. But in 1882, the Earlham faculty banded together, said no more baseball on campus. So basically they said, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. <laughs> so really baseball in Richmond did not catch on until a certain Makaija C. Henley, which is a very recognizable name once again around our city, jumped in the fray in 1885. Now he was, Henley was known as the roller skating king. I mean, 1885, the guy literally wrote the book on roller skates. And he kind of decides for the summer that he's, he's going to jump in this baseball fad. And only when Henley jumped into the fray did all of a sudden a lot of the external pressures around baseball kind of start easing because Henley was so well known. So he formed the Henley Baseball Club. Now, some of you might look and be like, that says baseball. Uh, that was actually how it was stylized for almost the entire 19th century as two words. So Henley was a bit of a self-promoter. He was very uh, almost braggadocious about his club and for good reason. But they played 38 games across three states. They were very good. And Henley declared his, his club not only the state champion in Indiana, but also Ohio and Kentucky. Not short on confidence. But of note, that same year, the Wayne Colored Baseball Club begins play. So they are actually the first black team in the city to form, at least on, on record. They play three games. They go two and one before disbanding. Unfortunately, Henley's team is covered almost daily during that summer. The Wayne Colored Baseball Club gets kind of a stray sentence here or there. So we don't know a whole lot about them. But we do know that the stars of the Henley Baseball Club were these two gentlemen. So one was named Joe Ardner, nickname of Old Haas. Not quite sure how he obtained such a nickname. Um, that is a very handsome mustache. I don't know if that's, I'm not sure, but he played second base, but he actually was an old major leaguer. He had played for the Cleveland Blues in 1884, and he would go on five years later and play for the Cleveland Spiders. So he played two different seasons in the major leagues, and he suited up for the Henley Baseball Club. The gentleman on the right, his name is Richard Van Zant, Dick Van Zant. He was known as the professor. I can't, not sure why, because he actually wasn't very well educated. Um, maybe he just thought he was smarter than he actually was. I don't know. But he actually played third base, and he also made it in with the Cleveland Blues in 1884. Now, uh, Ardner was an Ohio guy, but Dick Van Zant was a Richmond native. So he actually, um, you know, was the first professional baseball player from Richmond. All right. So moving forward, and honestly, a quick aside, because you can't tell the story of baseball in our area without talking about Claude Barry. So Claude Barry was born in LaSantville, not to split hairs. I know that's Randolph County, but he would ultimately spend most of his time in Wayne County. He would actually uh, pass away in Wayne County, spend all of his later years after he was done playing here in Richmond. He's buried in the Earlham Cemetery. Now, just as a quick story, on April 28th, 1904, Claude Barry is a 23-year-old rookie with the Chicago White Sox. He's sitting on the end of the bench, not really anticipating to go into the game. Uh, starting catcher, Billy Sullivan, goes down with an injury. I'll keep this as vague as possible, but fearing that he'd suffer the same injury as Sullivan, which I guess to Barry looked fairly painful, Barry entered the game with a protective cup that he had stuffed in his jock strap. So thus, longtime Wayne County resident, Claude Barry became the first player ever to wear a protective cup in a major league game. So how about that? Just in case that comes up at trivia night in your, uh, at your local watering hole, uh, Claude Barry is the first man to don a cup, uh, protective cup in a major league baseball game. 
Okay, so that brings us to the Negro Leagues. So again, between 1907 and 1959, there are approximately 125 confirmed games involving Negro League teams played here in Richmond, Indiana, which is astonishing. And the four teams you see listed here, if you're otherwise not aware of some of the teams in the old Negro Leagues, these are absolutely the highest profile teams there are. The Chicago American Giants came here 17 times. The Kansas City Monarchs and the Homestead Grays, who are probably the two most famous teams, came here five and six times respectively. And because of geographical location and you know all that, the Indianapolis Clowns came frequently, to say the least, 22 times that I was able to find. And so again, 350 Negro Leaguers appeared with their teams in Richmond, including an absolutely astounding 19 who are members now of the Baseball Hall of Fame, including, I'm just going to, this is kind of our gallery here. These are probably the four highest profile Negro League players. Josh Gibson, for one, played here three times. Josh Gibson may have hit more home runs than anyone who has ever lived. He was an absolute, well, he's a catcher, and he was one of the most prolific power hitters in baseball history and he came here three times we're going to talk about one of his infamous dingers here soon a round trippers home run sorry i'm using the baseball par lance i'm sure you're all picking up what i'm putting down now cool papa bell who also played here three times and he was so fast allegedly he was one of the first guys they said he could flip the switch in his bedroom and be under the sheets before the light actually goes out there was no one in baseball history, it is reputed, that was faster than Cool Papa Bell. Uh, he was an absolute, like, you know, that daring base stealer that really Jackie Robinson would kind of model his base running game after. Satchel Page, now he was uh, an amazing pitcher and he broke into the big leagues after the color barrier fell and he was well over 40 years old and he was already had already pitched for 20 years but it is said he kind of said this that he had uh, pitched in 2500 games won 2000 of them and had thrown 500 no hitters now this might be a little bit of an embellishment on his part but however there is no doubt that Satchel Paige is one of the greatest pitchers in in baseball history as you can see, he played for the Monarchs. You can kind of see it across his chest here. And this gentleman here, Oscar Charleston, came here no fewer than 14 times. And he is probably a top five player in baseball history. Uh, never got the chance to play in the major leagues. Was a Negro Leagues player his entire career. But he was a guy who could hit you home runs. He could steal you bases. He was just an astounding talent. And he was a mainstay here. And he was also something that is talked about a lot with Oscar is that he was fierce. And I mean fierce. I'm not saying he was a fierce competitor. He was a fierce human being. There is a story that gets bandied about. There is a story, pardon me, that after a game, some, someone said it was here in Indiana. Another person said it was down in Florida. But the Ku Klux Klan, this was in the 20s, mind you, circled the team bus Charleston was on. Again, this is after a baseball game. And uh, the Hoosier Comet, or Charlie, as he was otherwise known, Charlie gets off the bus, walks right up to a Klansman, plucks his hood off, throws it on the ground, and just stares at him. And the Klansman just stared back at him, allegedly, absolutely terrified. Apparently his buddies were terrified too because they all kind of parted and let the bus go. That was how imposing Charleston was. Uh, he was a very nice guy, don't get me wrong, but he was an absolute talent and a very fierce person. Like, he had a bit of a temper. So others, though not in the Baseball Hall of Fame, also made it to Major League Baseball, passed through the city with their Negro League teams, including a, a couple personal favorites of mine, Luke Easter, uh, Sam the Jet Jethro, who would eventually become the oldest rookie of the year in baseball history, because a lot of these guys, you know, a lot of them were too old when the color barrier fell. Uh, others, like Easter, had to lie about his age to get into major leagues because he feared if he told him their act, his actual age, no team would sign him. Uh, Hank Thompson, uh, who was an old monarch, the hero of the 1954 World Series, played here. And who could forget that catcher Clarence Choo Choo Coleman, who came here with the Indianapolis Clowns in 1957. Now, perhaps the biggest scoop of the entire project was not just all of these games where these teams were passing through, but the discovery of the Richmond Giants, who were our very own professional Negro League team. So 
I mentioned Bill Holland earlier. Just a quick note about Holland, aside from the fact that he was just really good and he started here when he was 17, he was the first black player to ever pitch a game in Yankee Stadium. What a distinction. And only four pitchers in Negro League history struck out more hitters than Devil Holland. All right, so we kind of talked about Oscar Charleston, uh, but there he is. There's another photo of him. Jack Hannibal. Okay, so he is one who's on the placard uh, over at Glenn Miller Park, but I absolutely love talking about this guy. If you're like, gee, Alex, that doesn't look much like a baseball player. That looks more like a boxer. You would be absolutely correct. Jack Hannibal was also a boxer, and he went by two nicknames. One was the Indianapolis Iron Man, and the other was the Fighting Poor Boy. He allegedly boxed, had 100 boxing matches in his entire life and only lost five. He was an absolute wonderful athlete, a great boxer, a great football player, and he was a good left fielder, and he suited up for our Richmond Giants. And then Connie Day was uh, a great second baseman. Uh, actually, he is in the top 10 in most meaningful categories uh, for all second basemen. He was a longtime baseball player, particularly in the Indianapolis area. A lot of the guys on the Richmond Giants were based out of Indianapolis. So who's the one who pulled the, the strings together? That was a local guy named George Brem. This is him pictured much, much later in life. Couldn't find a picture of young George Brem. But um, he's the one who brought the Richmond Giants together. And actually, they played all of their games at Exhibition Park. So again, that, that field where you would otherwise not think there was any way there was a baseball field there across from the main entrance of Glenn Miller Park, that is where Exhibition Park was. So in 17 games between June and September 1918, the Giants boasted nearly a, a 650 winning percentage. So they won essentially 65% of their games. They were very, very good. So why do the Giants matter? Oh, I had to get you a picture of Jack Hannibal while he's sparring here. Um, and there's uh, Connie Day, and there's a couple other guys here um, who are on the team. But why do they matter? So baseball is one of those things that people just really, really get into, and they try to discover new things all the time. And these are all very noteworthy players, including Charleston, who's a Hall of Famer. But the Giants were undiscovered and unchronicled until recently which this is, you know, like I said, through the annals of baseball history, this is really rare just to find brand new teams with such, you know, momentous players. And they boasted amazing talent, as I said. Uh, so eight, eight players of the Giants would go on to play in the Negro National League in the 1920s. So again, that's a league that was recently designated as a major league. So it was just a lot of folks after they were done playing for the Giants, would go on and play in these leagues. So really, really awesome. And of course, uh, let me get my cursor here. Charleston and Day, as well as Holland, are among the very best at their positions, center field, second base, and pitcher in Negro League's history. And from my vantage point, it truly solidifies the city's tie with the institution of Negro League's baseball. And I guess I'll have to show it off. I'm wearing it. I got my Richmond Giants shirt on. <laughs> so I'll have to show that off here once I stop sharing my screen. All right. So I, let's talk about one prodigious day, one prodigious home run by a certain Josh Gibson, who I, again, is probably the best home run hitter in baseball history. Okay. So I mentioned Exhibition Park burns down in 1935. On August 6, 1936, Municipal Stadium, now called McBride, opens. Okay, 639 days later, on May 7, 1938, Josh Gibson goes four for six on the game, hitting for the cycle. So that means he hit a double, or excuse me, a single, a double, a triple, and a home run. But his home run was the first one ever to go over the left field fence, which was 412 feet down the line. So it was deeper at other parts. That is an absolute mammoth home run. So next time you're at McBride and you're looking at that left field fence, uh, just imagine, first of all, that it was about 50 feet further and that Josh Gibson hit a ball over it. And he was the first one ever to do it. And just even more shocking is that nobody did it again for 3,311 days, not until 1947, did someone else do it? Bob Barrier of the Richmond Roses. And he was the first one to hit a home run over the left field fence since Josh Gibson's 1938 home run. But according to the paper, 
the fences were only 400 feet down the line. So it would only happen after the fences were actually moved in. I just think this is amazing how perhaps, you know, one of the best home run hitters in the Negro Leagues had easily, easily, you know, the, the best, the biggest, the most grand home run in Richmond history as well. You can't talk about baseball in Richmond, Indiana also without talking about a gentleman by the name of Reese Tatum. He went by Goose because he, I guess uh, people said he kind of walked like a goose. He kind of had a lot of swagger. He was actually the world's first athletic sensation worldwide. And that's because on the left-hand side here, yes, he played for the Harlem Globetrotters. He first came to Richmond in 1943 with the Globetrotters. His last stop in Richmond with the Globetrotters was in 1961. So he had about two decades where he was appearing here as a basketball player. Now, if you look at him, he, he was, first of all, 6'3". You might take note that he has incredibly long arms. He had a wingspan that was befitting of a seven-foot man. So he was absolutely, I, I mean, he was just built to be an athlete with those long arms. So he's, it's been said that Tatum had the athleticism of LeBron James with the comedic timing of Richard Pryor. And he kind of had to. Uh, he was the first baseman also for the Indianapolis Clowns. And the Clowns were definitely a team that were really, really good baseball players, but they had this entertainment value, almost like the Harlem Globetrotters of the baseball diamond. So Goose Tatum came to Richmond a multitude of times playing sports, uh, both sports. Uh, he is a National Basketball Hall of Fame member. He was inducted 10 years ago. And Goose actually died in 1967. But just to tell you about just his widespread fame internationally, in the early 2000s, the Globetrotters were visiting a Asian country, forgive me, the, which one is slipping my mind right now, for the first time ever, okay? And the crowd, this is again, four decades after the man has passed away. The crowd is chanting, Goose, 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 we want Goose, because they want to see Goose Tatum. That's the one Harlem Globetrotter they had heard about. And the PA speaker had to get over and uh, on the loudspeaker, um, the PA announcer, pardon me, and say, folks, really sorry, uh, but Goose actually died almost 40 years ago. And allegedly, some people got up and left. They came there to see Goose. And when he wasn't there, they were so upset that they left. Okay. And then in 1946, the perhaps best conglomeration of baseball talent came here, the Bob Feller All-Stars versus the Satchel Page All-Stars. What an amazing thing to come to the city, because as you can see, I kind of mapped it out here. These were all of the stops. So basically, this was after the Major League Baseball season was over. Feller got his team together. Page got his team together. Feller's team was white. Page's team was black. And they just, they went and they toured the country playing exhibition games against each other. But Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Chicago, Cincinnati, New York, Baltimore, Dayton, Richmond, which I think is just really, really cool. And uh, like I said, it was the very, very best conglom conglomeration of baseball talent. Uh, three Hall of Famers on Feller's team, 66 All-Star Game appearances between them all uh, on Page's team. There's two Hall of Famers. Five of those players would go on to play in the major leagues and break the color barrier. Three others would go sign minor league contracts. This is actually from the Palladium item. And if you could see here, this was actually, you could buy tickets at Brem's uh, sporting goods store. Who, Of course, George Brem was the gentleman who, uh, who put the Giants together, you know, about, uh, what was that, less, about 28 years before. So um, this game was a really, really big deal. So just mere months after that game, April 15th, 1947, Jackie Robinson suits up for the Brooklyn Dodgers, becoming the first black major leaguer since 1884. Again, our friend Moses Fleetwood Walker. So 63 years had passed. And I could talk about Robinson for an entire hour. He, he, there is no hyperbole that really adequately describes what he had to go through. And not only that, the pressure to not only just endure, but exceed expectations. And, you know, in 1947, he becomes the rookie of the year. And of course he has a hall of fame career, but that man, I mean, I know what his shoulders, you know, he's, he's got much wider shoulders, so to speak, than what any picture could possibly show metaphorically, of course, but the price of progress, 
So within a few years of integration at the major league level, most of the Negro League teams shuttered. So something that I'll say is not every major league owner compensated Negro League's teams. So the gentleman who signed Jackie Robinson was named Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey rightfully has a place in baseball history as the first owner, or excuse me, as the first general manager, pardon me, he didn't own the Giants, he was the general manager, to, to have a black player on his team. But however, he did not pay the Kansas City Monarchs, who Jackie was playing for, a single penny for, for Jackie. He just, he didn't view the, the Negro Leagues as a major league, as a viable commodity, as a, you know, so he would just willy-nilly sign players, and the players would, of course, jump at the opportunity to make much, much more money and so Jackie was actually signed from the Kansas City Monarchs without compensation to the Monarchs. That's not the case for a lot of the a lot of them owners. A lot of them did pay the Negro League teams, but many didn't. So if I could just kind of create an intersection here on May 26th, 1947. So 39 days after Jackie breaks the color barrier, James Cool Papa Bell, again, perhaps the second or third best Negro Leagues player in history, made his final appearance in Richmond with a team called the Detroit Senators. Exactly 352 spectators showed up. Really, that is indicative. The, the Negro Leagues held on for a number of years afterwards, but really to me, that is really indicative to just how quickly, though, that institution, which had been going on for decades, really just collapsed. Um, you got a guy like Cool Papa Bell come to town, and really the the, the interest just was not there almost immediately. All right. And I would be remiss not to mention as well that there were three women. Actually, there were more than three women, but there were three famous women who took part in the Negro Leagues too. Tony Stone, uh, Mamie Peanut Johnson, and Connie Morgan. So all three of the women uh, took the field in Richmond on June 28, 1954. Uh, Peanut and Connie were with the Clowns and Tony Stone, she was with the Monarchs. She actually had played for the Clowns the year before in 1953. And so all three of them actually were here. And yes, they were there to kind of draw crowds in. But really, these three got huge, widespread acclaim for their baseball playing prowess. In fact, Tony Stone hit almost 260 her rookie season for the Clowns. So she could hit. That's a, that's a very viable batting average. And she was not treated very well. In fact, um, she was not treated very well by her clown's teammates. They often would not let her stay in the team hotel with them. So Tony would oftentimes have to find brothels to stay in. And that's often what she did. In fact, she soon developed a network of brothels across the country. And she befriended, you know, she befriended the sex workers and they would actually come out to the games in, in legions and cheer her on which I thought was really cool. Um, she later said that they sewed extra padding in her, in her uniform because she would oftentimes get spiked, um, which is if people slide into you with their, with their cleats up to try to hurt you, uh, and they would give her extra money for meals. It was just a really, really cool story. Um, and actually, if you're more interested in Tony Stone, there is a Broadway play about her called Tony Stone, and uh, it's really, really neat. All right, so... I will stop my share here. I'm going to grab a quick drink and I am open for questions. Let's see. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll stop my share. I don't know if I'm if I've succeeded in doing that or not. You have. Um and oh, thank you. I don't see anything in there yet, but I will say that um if you um, either A, want to put it in the chat box, or B, unmute yourself and ask. You can ask a question. <laughs> Do a terrible baseball pun, but it might seem as though I covered all the bases. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I've got a question. You say you have a shirt from that team. What, tell us about that shirt and your hat. Oh, yes. That, David, I appreciate it. Oh, I, I did promise this. So, okay. Uh, so thanks to our friends at, at Black Dog Printing. We're going to do another fundraiser, but we got this new um, marker in at Glenn Miller. And again, I, 
I'm a little bit smitten with it. Like every time I pass by, like I'm like staring, seeing if anybody, I, I've pledged to myself, if I drive past this marker and anybody is like reading it, I'm going to just kind of veer off and just start talking to them about it a little bit more. So we did this t-shirt fundraiser from Black Dog Printing. So this was actually the t-shirt. Um, it is the uh, Richmond Giants here. Uh, underneath the baseball, it says Dandies of the Diamond, because that's what the Richmond item called them was the Dandies of the Diamond. And so they made it to the city championship in 1918. So it says city championship 1918 professional Negro Leagues baseball club in Richmond, Indiana. So it's not currently available, but uh, we had quite a bit of interest in the first run. So I'm thinking we're probably going to do it again now um, and offer them through, again, one of our local uh, um, clothers. So the hat is, sorry, hat hair. This is the Baltimore Black Sox. So um, one of those Negro Leagues teams. I am a personal fan of the Baltimore Black Sox because, honestly, uh, Richmond Giants second baseman and shortstop Connie Day played for them for a while. So that is why I end up wearing a Baltimore Black Sox hat but they were also a Negro Leagues team throughout the 1920s and 30s. I've got another question. Fire away, David. Yeah, I'm surprised to hear about this marker in Glen Miller Park. I read the PAL item pretty regularly. I've never seen any mention of this. Has this yeah, ever we, been advertised, you know, promoted? It, uh, it, not, not in the pay. It's interesting because you're right. Like the PAL item or Western Wayne haven't quite picked it up yet. Uh, our plan was to do the dedication and share that information out. A little bit wider but unfortunately the dedication didn't happen um well wednesday no thursday pardon me um so our plan is to just continue to push it as much as we can um it has been uh really a one or two person show um we had great we had great cooperation from the mayor's office as well as uh the parks but as far as the design and fundraising and just persistence this has been kind of a two-person show so our marketing department i need to i need to get our marketing guy on the horn <laughs> um one one final thing please you indicated your interest in jackie robinson um my father and his brother went to school with jackie robinson in pasadena california my my uncle was on on the track team both at junior college and at ucla and i have uh annuals with pictures of Jackie Robinson and all the sports he played. If you're ever interested in seeing it, I live here right in Richmond. My, my wife volunteers at the museum. They can give you the contact information, but I'd be glad to show you that those uh, UCLA annuals with pictures of Jackie and descriptions of his exploits in all the sports, if you're ever interested. I, I, I am incredibly interested, David. I appreciate you telling me that. Uh, my family and I, we are actually members at the museum now. And so we will, we will, I'll get your information. I, I love to hear about Jackie's other sports because they said, it has been said that baseball might have been his fifth best sport behind, right. uh, yeah, behind track, basketball, baseball. And apparently Jackie was a pretty mean tennis player too. <laughs> That's about the only team that didn't get in this annual. But anyway, my wife volunteers at the museum. They can, they can give you our contact information. I'll be glad to show you those pictures. Oh my gosh, I'd love to see him. I'd love yeah. to see him. Um, I, won't, I won't bother and let somebody else ask some questions. <laughs> oh gosh, no, Dave, fi sincerely, fi fire away. I appreciate it. Uh, we have one in the chat. Uh, Princess says, I had no idea women played during this time with the men. Were there no more women's teams after the war? So that's a great question. Now, here's what I will say about it. Uh, so the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, which I am also happen to be pretty fond of, <laughs> Uh, was in existence from 1943 to 1954. However, the All-American Girls, so basically I guess what I'm saying is, is right about the time that Connie and Peanut Johnson and Tony Stone were playing in the Negro Leagues, that was the waning moments of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, made popular, of course, by a league of their own, the movie, uh, which is a really, really fun movie. But what I'll say about the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, sorry, that's a mouthful, is that it was not integrated. So if a woman wanted to play baseball and she was a woman of color, the Negro Leagues were actually her only option. So um, there would have been no spots for them in, in that, in the women's league. So I appreciate that question. Uh, 
does anyone else have a question for Alex before we uh, conclude for the night? Maggie, if I could just, uh, if I could just say, uh, hey, appreciate the question, Adam. I do appreciate everybody coming in and, and listening. I, I really, I know it's Friday night, but like I said, there's no better time to talk about baseball. We have, we have set the bar for this weekend just incredibly high. So it's, it's one might even say it's all downhill from here. But uh, Adam asked if there are any other upcoming projects. Thank you, pal. Um, actually, I, I've, I've published three books. So this one was my second one. Something that I just didn't get into for this presentation is kind of East Central Indiana's own Negro Leagues player. His name is John Merida. Uh, he goes, uh, his nickname in the day was Snowball. He played from 1895 to through 1911. And so he was an absolute sensational player. And I'm not just saying that because I have an extreme fondness for his story. He was so good. And of course, we kind of laid out the line of the timeline of uh, baseball's racial history. John Merida was so good. He was from Spiceland, Indiana, so over in Henry County. He was so good that he played for white teams as the only person of color on white teams for 1895. Pardon me, I'm going to do some quick math. About 10 years. I mean, that's how good he was. And he finally breaks in with the Indianapolis ABCs, plays in Richmond, plays in Allen Earlham's campus. Um, he was an absolute star. And unfortunately, he died very young. He died in 1911. So the pages of time just turned on John Merritt, and he was almost completely forgotten. In fact, he was forgotten. He was buried in an unmarked grave in Spiceland for 65 years. And um, so I just completed a work on John Merritt, and uh, uh, I don't want to get too far down the John Merritt rabbit hole because I won't stop, Adam, as you can attest. So, but that's that's new. I'm still kind of kicking around the, a few more ideas. Uh, I've constantly got to be doing something along these lines. So I haven't decided where I'm going to go next, but thank you. Um, oh, so Joe asked, uh, well, he says, I love all the local info and the random facts about a topic that's not been discussed enough. So thank you for that. Uh, how are you able to find sources for such a scarce topic? So fortunately, I, was, I had to do like a lot of the old fashioned microfish, uh, which if you've ever seen like one of those machines in the library where you're literally scrolling page, 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 day after day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. It was, that's how I had to do a lot of the Merida work, which was just, oh, it was painstaking. Fortunately for us, the Richmond newspapers all the way back into the 19th century have been digitized. So they're actually pretty, if you know what you're looking for, it's just about finding it and, and chronicling it in a way that you can stay on top and organized with. So Fortunately for us, again, here, you know, the, uh, the, pa the Palladium item, the Richmond item, even the Richmond Palladium Weekly are all digitized on newspapers.com. So with that, you can kind of look for search terms and, oh, it makes it so much easier. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Okay, any final questions? So I wanna thank everyone. Uh, oh, here's another question. Ah, Dane says writing three books takes an incredible amount of time. Uh, how did you decide to focus on baseball? Uh, I, I have been a, just quick, I, I've been a baseball fan as long as I can remember and I loved playing it, but even more so than playing it, uh, I just loved studying it, looking at old photographs and statistics. I'm kind of a stats person. Um, I'm really bad at math, but man, I love sports statistics. I, like I said, I studied history. But um, honestly, the uh, the Negro Leagues kind of sprouted in, um, in when I was just a kid. And I remember I bought an action, a Josh Gibson action figure. They were called starting line. Anyways, uh, and so I remember thinking like, I haven't seen this before. And then I did some digging on Gibson in this baseball book I had at home. And I was like, man, you know, Josh Gibson hit more home runs than anyone. Cool Papa Bell is faster than a twister. Um, but so really, I mean, uh, baseball is like kind of hooked me since I was just a, a little kid. And I, I've always kind of had a bit of a neurotic personality. So once I'm kind of hooked on something, 
I, it's hard for me to shake it. <laughs> uh, what has been the most interesting bit of information? Yeah, I'll give a quick story, a uh, quick one. In 1933, only because I was just telling somebody about this, the Chicago American Giants came to town um, and they were playing the Richmond Linkos, which was a local semi-pro team that was uh, sponsored by the local gas company. Okay, so now the Chicago American Giants traveled through the night to play an early afternoon game. So they were clearly exhausted. I think they came in from St. Louis. This is in 1933. There are no interstates. I don't want to know how long it took to drive from St. Louis to Richmond, Indiana without that straight shot on I-70. So anyways, they come in and they're clearly bushed. They have four future Hall of Famers on the Chicago American Giants, and they are absolutely waxed by the Richmond Linkos. Now, the interesting part about the Linkos is they had a Hall of Famer of their own playing in right field, Weeb Eubank, who was a football Hall of Famer. He played, he was a teacher, and he would play semi-pro baseball in the summer to kind of earn some extra money but he would ultimately become one of the most successful coaches in the National Football League. So there were five, there were five Hall of Famers on the field that one day, four baseball Hall of Famers on the American Giants, the Negro League team, and the, the uh, Richmond Linkos Gas Company team absolutely demolished this team that had all these baseball. Like, it's baseball. That's what makes it amazing, right? You just never know. But that was definitely an interesting thing. And... Um, being able to track down that all those women played, that all three women played here on the same day was awesome too. I mean, that was so unexpected. And I got just the sheer amount of talent that, you know, unless you're really, really kind of getting into the minutia, you'd never know came here. I appreciate the question. And I just want to say again, I appreciate everyone's time. Um, thank you. Thank you so much.